Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Hyun Soo Young from uh, NUS. So I slightly changed my title to you know, cover more broad topics. Since uh, Claudia yesterday talked about wild semi metals, so I wanted to show some of our recent data. You know, here there are so many great physicists, so I will identify myself as an engineer. As you can see, I'm from uh, electrical engineering. And uh, as evidence, I will show you a, a chip which I designed 1998, okay, so 21 years ago, I started my career as a circuit designer at that time. Uh, then the frequency was uh, 50 megahertz. So now, if, if you look at the CPU clock, do you know the CPU clock right now, roughly? A couple gigahertz. So basically we improved about 100 times last 20 years. Okay, do you think we can improve another 100 times next 20 years? No? <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> we need to? We have to? Uh, I think the right answer is uh, nobody knows. <laughs> That's the right answer. Right? But anyhow, we have to do something you know, as a researcher. So that's why a lot of people are working on like 2D materials. We have to change our channel material, no more silicon. A lot of you know, people are working on like gallium arsenide types of you know, two-dimensional electron gas to improve the frequency. But I think the obvious direction would be, you know, why do we just use a spin, which was completely ignored in conventional charge electronics? And anyhow, every electron has a spin. So let's utilize those. So I think spintronics is obviously the right way to go, which I don't need to persuade you, because we are all in the same community. OK? But if I talk to, you know, see most people, it's very hard to convince. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, if you look at the modern, you know, progress of uh, spin talk MRAM, now we are in really in the you know, time stage, uh, the STTM name is commercialized. So three years ago, Everspin with the global founder in Singapore produced the first STT sampling chips. They shipped to many system integration company vendors and they are about to release their product now. Last year, IBM started shipping this uh, flash core module buffered with the STTM name. So they put STTM name as a buffer memory to improve the system performance. This year, Samsung announced a 28 nanometer embedded uh, MRAM. So they put MRAM with their MCU core in one single chip. So they already shipped this product to some customers. And I think we will see you know, consumer electronics uh, very soon. And many companies will join this effort this year and next year and so on. So as an academia, we have to think about you know, what will be the future next generation technology. So we open quote, spin orbital MRAM is the you know, possible next generation technology. So I'm not going to go through all this history, you know, starting from uh, Diagonov. He's still active in France, 1971. Then a lot of scientists you know, picked up this uh, uh, you know, interesting topic. And depending on the origin, we typically distinguish you know, whether it's coming from bulk originated spin hole or interfacial originated, like Lush by Eldestein, and so on. But in reality, it's not very easy to distinguish. Because if you look at this case, you know, as a starting material, what do you have when you do the experiment? You start with the substrate. So you have substrate and your material, you have interface. If you have interface, you have this effect coming from interface. Now, if you look at top, my material has another interface. If you are a theorist, you call it a vacuum interface. But in real experiment, there's no vacuum. So it's a you know, capping layer or air interface. Another interface will give you this effect. So in reality, it's not easy to distinguish. But you know, referee always asks us to distinguish which one is dominant in your case. So, the easiest way is always we change our film thickness. So if you change your film very thick, we assume it's a bulk dominated. If you make it thin and thin, probably interface effects start to dominate. So in this graph, you can extrapolate, you know, thick regime, thin regime, and you can talk about. So the first measurement of such a kind of an experiment was reported by uh, Japan, Masamitsu Hayashi Group in 2013. So in case of tantalum, they change the thickness from like a two nanometer down to very thin. <coughs> and initially, this material is, everybody knows, in a negative spin or angle, effectively. That's what they measured. But as they change the thickness below 0 0.5 nanometer, they see a you know, kind of small evidence, but it's quite clear. Uh, you know, spin or effectively change sign to positive number. So initially, I saw this report uh, quite surprised. How come it's possible? In conventional spin hole physics, it's not possible to change, you know, uh, effective sign. So we repeated this experiment in my lab, and indeed it's happening. 
So the next question was, you know, let's try some other materials. Is it really general phenomena or is it only specific to this material? So we repeated many other materials and we, indeed we see, you know, very similar behavior. This is one example, half new. So we started from 20 nanometer. We see, you know, conventional negative spin hole. Then once we go below 6 nanometer, the amplitude decreases. So this is typical, you know, spin hole types of behavior. But if we go down below 1.8 nanometer, there is sign change in both cases, longitudinal torque and uh, you know, transverse torque. Uh, even though it's a small, well, I think it's a very clear evidence. So as a naive you know, experimentalist, how do I interpret it? It's very simple to me. If you have a very thick film, it's a spin hole dominated. If you go thin, maybe some interfacial effect you know, dominate. However, this guy has opposite sign to conventional spin hole. Then you can flip the sign. So, you know, a lot of people commented, yeah, interesting physics, maybe something is ongoing, but who cares? Huh? Because the value is so tiny, you know, and uh, nobody will use huh, like a 0 0.5 nanometer film because anyhow, maybe it's not continuous. Maybe true. But recently we did a very strange experiment. We, this is a, again very simple, you know, platinum cobalt ion boron system, which is known as a positive spin or angle. Then we change our capping thickness, silicon oxide, and as we know, you know, silicon oxide, native oxide thickness is 1.5 nanometer. So once you take it out from chamber, it immediately, you know, form 1.5 nanometer silicon oxide. This is why silicon became the, you know, the uh, make a uh, big success actually in the uh, major CMOS industry. It's because of silicon oxide. It's not because of silicon. But anyhow, uh, depending on whether the capping is below 1.5 or above 1.5, we see very strange behavior. 1.5, more than that we see a typical positive spin or angle in terms of anomalous switching you know, uh, signature. But below 1.5, we see it's a negative spin or angle. And once we extract the magnitude, we found it's pretty much the same. If you look at this uh, longitudinal effective field, below 1.5, you know, 150 <coughs> negative, and more than 1.5 is about positive 150, you know, or that. Uh, so it shows once we can uh, do some kind of oxygen, you know, interfacial doping, uh, we can change its effective sign with similar magnitude. So recently, we were able to repeat this experiment in a single uh, device using gadolinium oxide. Gadolinium oxide is known as uh, oxygen reservoir, initially reported by you know, Jeffrey Beach and the uh, Weigang Wang group. So they use this gadolinium oxide to modulate the oxygen to their device and change it from the anisotropy, from in-plane to perpendicular, perpendicular to in-plane in a reversible way. So we were motivated by uh, that work, and then we tried to you know, combine this gadolinium oxide in spin orbit talk and see what happened. So this is, again, very you know, conventional uh, positive spin hole system, platinum, cobalt. Uh, and then we put gadolinium oxide, and by gating this, we can push oxygen into cobalt. And once we apply a positive uh, voltage, we can pull back this oxygen in a, in a reversible way. By doing this, we found spin hole angle change from positive to negative, positive to negative, with almost equal magnitude. So we were able to repeat you know, our earlier experiment now in a single device and uh, show uh, kind of feasibility we can sort of you know, state, uh, program those direction by gating. So this gives a kind of opportunity to think about like FPGA types of you know, application in spin logic. To understand the underlying uh, principle, we had a collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Nicholas in California State. He's the first principle calculation person. So uh, he can put oxygen at any layer. As soon as he put the uh, oxygen between cobalt platinum, indicated as I here, uh, he found the Lashiba coefficient suddenly changed sign from positive to negative. So this uh, simulation you know, gave us uh, kind of indication this indeed this interface is uh, you know, very important. And once you dope about 25% of oxygen, uh, we can flip the sign. And experimentally, there is no way we can put oxygen in a specific layer. So what we are doing is, uh, you know, we sort of uh, oxidize uh, all together, whole layer, because it's only one nanometer plus minus. Uh, and we found about 30% of oxidation uh, will trigger this uh, sign change. During the operation, we found a very gradual change. We can start from like positive 5% uh, you know, spin or angle, then once we apply negative voltage, oxygen will be pushed into cobalt and the value gradually decrease and we can go to negative value. Then by changing the gating to positive value, now we can pull back oxygen 
and we can go back to you know budget number. And when you see this analog operation, now people are excited. Oh, this is opportunity to make a neuromorphic device. <laughs> uh, but as I show you my earlier chip, at that time, 21 years ago, my job was changing analog function to digital. <laughs> that was my job, specifically. Now we want to go back to analog. So if you stay another 20 years, <laughs> what will happen? Everybody will go back to digital. Because research is cycling. Yeah. Huh? It's recorded, huh? oh, I should be careful about that. <laughs> Why are we excited? Because there is huge funding opportunity. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> science is so great. Huh? So if you look at uh, neuromorphic computation, you know, this is our so-called uh, uh, von Neumann architecture, where CPU and memory separated. Massive data transfer between those two guys. What's the speed? The speed of gigahertz. So we consume more than 50% of our energy just transferring in and out this, All right? If you look at our brain, what happened? Memory and CPU coexist at the same location. So we don't need to do this. The other one is, if you look at the speed, as I mentioned, this guy is a gigahertz, but our brain is so slow. It's tens of hertz, okay? So what will happen if our brain operates at gigahertz? How do you think? <laughs> Heat. We don't need any heater in the winter time because everybody is a heater. Number two, there's no way you can live like 100 years. I think our lifetime can be very short. Uh, so this is the beauty of uh, slowness and massive you know, parallel computation. But anyhow, if you look at the operation principle of this uh, human body signal processing, it's action potential based. What it does? Sodium, you know, this, you know, potassium ion in and out in the membrane. Depending on concentration, you define your potential difference, signal propagate. So we try to mimic this operation using our you know, oxygen migration device. In this case, our ion is oxygen. And what we measure is a potential is anomalous whole potential. That's what we can measure. So we did this experiment. We can change the pulse delay, you know, giving to the gate. So this is called like a spike rate uh, dependence. We can also send two pulses to our gate, depending on correlation, whether two pulses you know, arrive at the same time or far away. We can change the potential you know, a lot or almost negligible way. This type of measurement is called spike time dependent uh, plasticity, which is a kind of key data to show your junction is like a synaptic. We can also show learning and forgetting. We can keep sending our signal to gate, increase potential. Once you stop, you are gating, as time goes, the signal decays. So this is like a forgetting, like our human brain. We can also show training depending on how many pulses we initially give, 10, 20, 30, 40, and then we measure this relaxation time constant. If you train more, it you know, decays slowly. So this is called a long-term delay, uh, so long-term memory, and this is called short-term memory. So it looks like you know, I can really mimic uh, our human brain types of you know, signal. Now, do you think I can make artificial brain connecting all my you know, millions of junctions together? How do you think? It's easy? I think that will be scary if I can do. Uh, there are two conditions huh, if you want to really mimic human brain. Number one, I have to make one million neurons per square centimeter. Using conventional microfabrication, do you think I can make one million junction per square centimeter? It's very easy. Huh? Uh, Intel can make one billion, no problem, huh? one billion transistors. <laughs> Global Foundry, they can make one billion, no problem at all. Next one is a scary part. Huh? We need 10 to 10 synapses per square centimeter. So if you divide by number of neurons, each neuron should have 10,000 connections. What does that mean? If you look at this uh, schematic, you have one neuron, how many connections you have? 10,000 connections. If you remember the modern you know, cross-point architecture, how many connections do you have per single MTJ? Two. Two. Hmm? Yeah, you have top and bottom, huh? word line and B line, simply. Spin orbital memory, how many connections do you need? Three. You, have, you need three. So if you now talk to the industry people, I need another line, you know what is their response? <laughs> oh my god, I have need another transistor all the way, metal wire, then the layout, ah, so difficult. That's the reaction. Okay, now if you tell them I need 10,000 connections per single, you know, what will be their reaction? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> huh? Okay, so 
if you want to make a very general computation, this is required to mimic our you know, human body types. Of. However, there are you know, many people claiming we don't need such a connection if you want to do specialized function, image recognition. You can do with a conventional cross-point architecture, no problem. I think tomorrow, uh, Fukami will probably you know, talk about this kind of stuff. So anyhow, I think that's the, probably the way to go. We have to make a specialized function. Generalized you know, computation will be probably very difficult immediately. All right. So going back to um, spin talk stuff, uh, you know, imaging is believing. We really want to understand uh, what is the spin texture you know, driven by current. Um, the conventionally, people use the magnetic optical curve imaging, but it's very successful in semiconductors, but it's not easy to repeat in a metal. Uh, recently, you know, Pietro group also showed it is possible, but it's not full imaging. So we try to uh, develop a new technique called scanning photovoltaic microscope with current. So in a defined channel, once you apply DC current, you can accumulate it, you know, spin up and down, separate it. Uh, then we shine circular polarized light, and depending on the polarization, amount of absorption will change uh, depending on local spin population. This principle is called magnetic circular dichroism, MCD, which X-ray people use every day to you know, image the magnetism. Then we define the photovoltage in longitudinal direction, subtract the right hand and left hand you know, signal. So let's say I shine my laser exactly in the middle, and then you know, left and right, if I you know, calculate this signal, I will have a zero because I will have equal spin population, so absorption of light will be same. Once I move my laser spot to one of the edge, then I have now preferred spin you know, accumulation. Due to this, uh, it will break the symmetry, so this voltage will not be the same, and then eventually I will have a finite voltage. So depending on you know, spin population, I can have either positive or negative. So this is the principle. Then I have a pH sample stage, and I can move, and the image as a two-dimensional you know, form. So I apply to platinum at zero charge current, nothing happened because my injection is zero. As I increase my uh, charge current, three and six, I can clearly see bluish and reddish, you know, representing down and up spins accumulated at opposite edges. Once I flip my current, I can see now red and uh, blue, which is exactly opposite. I can easily apply to now semiconductor, bismuth selenide, people call it a topological insulator, but uh, in my mind, it's a very dirty semiconductor at room temperature. A zero charge current, nothing happened, but as you can see, one milliamp, I can see blue and red, opposite charge current, and it is red and blue, which is exactly opposite. Uh, if you look at now very carefully, in the middle of the channel, platinum gives almost zero signal. This is expected because my measurement only couples spin up and down. But in principle, in the middle of the channel, we should have in-plane spin component, which I cannot measure here. But now, if you look at carefully in this case, uh, bismuth selenide, I can see there is a shift to downward, kind of bluish here. But if you look at now this one, there is a shift to a little bit upward, kind of reddish signal. So this is coming from uh, so-called hexagonal warping. So in real materials, our materials are not ideal, and it's heavily doped. So the Fermi level is way above the Dirac point. So at that point, the Fermi surface is distorted. It's no more circular. Okay? It's a hexagonal shape. And depending on the K vector, and we can see this uh, so-called uh, outer plane uh, spin polarization. <laughs> so this is uh, in line with our early observation. Uh, in which we measure this uh, outer plane uh, spin orbit torque in uh, bismuth selenide. Uh, so due to this uh, interesting uh, effect, people were excited, you know, this topological uh, insulator should give us a very large uh, uh, spin hole angle. So a lot of people tried to measure those. Uh, initially, Cornell reported the uh, effective spin hole angle is 2 to 3.5 uh, in the bismuth selenide. About the same time, I was trying to push our paper uh, then uh, we didn't you know, have uh, good luck because of uh, this paper they put in archive and referees keep saying, you know, their value is so large and your value is 0 0.01 and um, you must be wrong. <laughs> so they shoot us and uh, had a hard time to go through. But anyhow, then I decided, you know, maybe it's a different, you know, different technique. Huh? They use STFMR and we use spin pumping. Maybe we should use same technique. So we tried to use same technique, STFMR. Then we found the spin or angle now improved suddenly 42 times and 0.42 only at low temperature. 
Uh, but anyhow, the field is really messy. If you look at the Hoku report about the same time, their spinal angle is 0 0.0001. Okay? And if you look at the UCLA report, the spinal angle is up to 425. <laughs> of course, slightly different materials. Huh? Uh, this is BSTS, this is uh, antimony doped. But no matter what, huh? how can you know, the behavior change uh, seven orders of magnitude from here to here? So some theorists commented, oh, the you experimenters don't know what you guys are doing. This is a problem. <laughs> so I replied, huh? uh, you gave us a wrong formula, maybe. You know? <laughs> this is your problem. <laughs> so anyhow, recently we had the chance to sit down and uh, figure it out what's going on. Then we write down the spinal angle as a function of the film thickness people used. Mm -hmm. And we found the beautiful inverse scaling. Uh, it's so simple. Once you have this data, it's so easy to understand. Okay? As I mentioned, the Fermi level is way up here. It's not in the middle of this gap. So because of this region, once we inject charge current in this material, a lot of current shunting happens through the bulk. Bulk doesn't have strong spin orbit coupling in this material. Only surface has this very intrinsic you know, spin momentum locking, which we want to utilize. And more than 90% currents are shunted through the bulk. So that's why once you use very, very thick film, what's going on? All the charge current going to the bulk. You never utilize surface. You never see this effect. Once you go below about 10 nanometer, now you start to operate your device using this uh, surface state. And you start to see this very interesting uh, behavior. So we choose a nanometer because this is kind of optimum you know, with a reasonably large spin efficiency. But always we have to think about device resistivity. If your device resistivity is so high, your power consumption will be so large. So then we put a nickel ion 6 nanometer, and then we pattern into many different squares. So we want to show you know, reliable switching. Then uh, you know, this uh, yellow square is uh, a single sort of each uh, nickel ion squares. Then we apply charge current from left electrode. Initially, black domain indicating everything is saturated in this direction. As we increase the charge current, you can see white domain now is getting larger and larger. And eventually, we can switch everything to opposite direction. From here, we can inject charge current from right electrode. We can see you know, black domain propagate, and everything now saturated to initial direction. This is measured at room temperature, and the current density was 6 times 10 to 5th ampere per square centimeter. So it's like two orders smaller than heavy metal case uh, without any magnetic field because we are dealing with uh, in-plane magnet. And the extracted spinal angle was uh, 1.75. So we show, you know, this you know, used to be a kind of physicist toy, you know, topological insulator. But if we choose you know, the right thickness and play with this material, even we can show you know, large effect, even at room temperature. But still, the problem is the bismuth selenide is grown by molecular beam epitaxy, which is not really scalable technology. Then we noticed a very interesting report by a Jinping Wang group in Minnesota. So they showed uh, sputtered bismuth selenide can give rise a very large spinal angle, like 18. And uh, the switching current density was uh, four times 10 to fifth ampere <coughs> per square centimeter. Uh, so motivated by this work, I followed a you know, similar approach. So we sputtered uh, this bismuth selenide in a conventional you know, sputter machine, purchased this uh, sputter target. Then we show about 10 nanometer bismuth selenide. We can show a similar effect. We injected current, the magnetization flip from here to here. And here we apply the current from right electrode, we can flip. But the problem is when we sputtered this bismuth selenide, we found uh, resistivity increase more than 100 times compared to MB grown sample. So we are making really good you know, semiconductor now by this uh, sputtering. This is a problem because when we try to switch this uh, metallic layer on top, we will have a lot of current shunting. So once we calculate the to total power consumption, it's not very beneficial. Uh, because of this current shunting issue, the total current is quite large. As you can see, it's like almost 10 to 7 order. Uh, you know. So we are switching our material to new topological material called wild semi-metals. And this material, as the name stands for, is a metal. Uh, and not only surface, the bulk also has a large spin you know, polarization and large spin orbit coupling. So it's predicted to give a very large uh, spin orbit torque. 
Uh, so we are doing same measurement. So we choose this uh, tungsten ditelluride and we put the perm alloy on top and then we pattern device. And uh, this material is a very anisotropic depending on the current injection direction, whether you are injecting along the A or B, you can see you know, quite different behaviors. This is example current along the B direction and then we can uh, polarize our spin along the A direction. Uh, and uh, this is initial uh, magnetization direction. As we increase the current, we switch from black to white. Starting from white, we can you know, also switch back. So uh, switching current is uh, 1.5 times 10 to fifth, which is about four times smaller than uh, that of the topological insulator. But once we calculate the power consumption because of uh, small resistivity, the total power consumption drops about one order compared to uh, topological insulator case. Anyhow, this material is very interesting. Uh, we are trying to also measure the uh, spin relaxation time constant using magneto-optical uh, 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 measurement. And this is a CBD grown film. Is a, this is an example of 1 cm by 1 cm by our collaborator. It's very uniform. Uh, and thickness is about 6 nanometer in this case. And we found the spin relaxation time is 1.2 nanosecond. And this is uh, about 1,000 times longer compared to topological insulator. So this material, I think, is very interesting. Very large spin orbit coupling, yet very long spin relaxation time, even at room temperature, and large you know, spin orbit torque. Uh, all right, so going now back to the magnetic materials uh, aspect. Um, a lot of people initially you know, uh, utilized this uh, ferromagnetic material by Pietro and uh, group and then this Cornell group. Then we are excited about this opportunity of uh, anti-ferromagnet to mitigate you know, thermal stability issue and so on. But the major problem I think we have to work on is the you know, small MR. When you talk to industry people, uh, you know, we always try to show we can switch with a very low current and so on. They, they don't care about switching. What they care is more reading. Okay? Because in real memory, you read about 1,000 times more frequently than writing. Okay? So that's why the, uh, and the reading speed uh, is inversely proportional to MR value. And right now, industry use about 200% TMR you know, for operation of uh, tens of nanosecond reading. Now this is a nanosecond, it's a 20 nanosecond reading. Okay? If you want to go down to nanosecond reading, you need much larger TMR. Hmm? All right? So this is a major you know, bottleneck, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, I think our community need to attack. Uh, about the reading aspect, not only writing. So anyhow, uh, immediately, in my view, you know, we should uh, utilize uh, a multi-layer or a ferry magnet as the next immediate generation uh, technology because I'm working with uh, Global Foundry guys. Uh, so we are doing this experiment, uh, ferry magnet, cobalt gadolinium. So depending on composition, uh, it can be cobalt dominated or gadolinium dominated. And in fact, we can study all the way from uh, ferromagnetic-like phase to anti-ferromagnetic-like phase. Uh, so with the platinum spin current, we can study those. Uh, by changing the gadolinium composition, 20% gadolinium is uh, very close to still ferromagnetic dominate, like a pure cobalt. 25% gadolinium is almost like uh, perfectly compensated, like anti-ferromagnetic-like. So we can you know, measure those all the way. Uh, and then we found uh, spin orbital efficiency increase about 10 times. Uh, once you go close to this anti-ferromagnetic you know, coupled regime. And we attributed this is due to uh, negative exchange uh, torque. Uh, earlier, IBM introduced this uh, negative exchange torque concept in their synthetic anti-ferromagnet. Okay? Uh, so then they reported very high domain wave velocity up to 750 meter per second. But in our case, we now bring in this anti-ferromagnetic coupling in an atomic region because we just put you know, alloy. Uh, if you look at now carefully, this is more cobalt dominated region. And if you look at this side, this is more gadolinium dominated region. And it's not symmetric. Uh, uh, if you look at this curve, this is very stiff. However, in gadolinium case, uh, you know, it, it kind of goes down and uh, uh, sort of saturated. And uh, I think this is due to the response speed of cobalt gadolinium. When you inject, uh, you know, angular momentum into this material, cobalt react first. It's more effective guy. Then gadolinium follows, which was measured by 
you know, the chimeras and uh, Theo and so on, you know, early days. But when you have now gadolinium rich regime, because cobalt volume is small, when you inject a lot of, you know, conduction electrons with angular momentum, the cobalt cannot absorb immediately all this momentum. Uh, so that's why the efficiency in this regime is smaller than, uh, you know, cobalt dominated regime. Uh, but anyhow, we try to now uh, combine this uh, ferrimagnetic concept with the super lattice. Uh, and the super lattice, you know, has been widely used in many uh, areas like uh, optoelectronics and so on. And then we show um, by uh, having this uh, super lattice, once you inject the spin, initially you deface your spin in cobalt lattice. But in next uh, layer of lattice, we recover its uh, spin. Uh, it's like a spin repeater concept in uh, fiber communication technology. Uh, so anyhow, we show uh, the spin torque you know, efficiency in improve about uh, 20 times once we have now super lattice. So if you remember the previous alloy, we showed the 10 times enhancement, but by doing uh, you know, a multi-layer, then we improved another two times more. So I'll just skip the, all the details. Uh, then uh, I just want to show this the data is a spin pumping into ferry magnet to prove uh, this material indeed has a long spin coherent length. Uh, so we injected in plane spin and uh, we put a copper to uh, decouple this layer. Uh, then we have a cobalt nickel or a cobalt terbium layer. Cobalt nickel is a kind of ferromagnetic you know, phase and cobalt terbium is a, a ferromagnetic phase. Uh, then uh, once we put uh, 0.9 nanometer cobalt nickel uh, perpendicular layer, basically spin pumping signal is zero. That means this spin is immediately defaced by about one nanometer uh, ferromagnet, which is well known. You know, the typical spin defacing length in ferromagnet is about one nanometer. But in case of uh, ferry magnet, uh, we can see even 5.3 nanometer ferry magnet, we can see a clear spin pumping signal. And we indeed studied as a function of this uh, uh, cobalt terbium thickness. And we were able to see the signal all the way up to 13 nanometer. And uh, we stopped here because we never expect spin signal can you know, survive up to this. Uh, probably it's much longer. So anyhow, as a quick summary, I show you, you know, spin orbit technology as a next generation memory. Uh, oxygen modulation can give rise to very interesting behavior. It can sort of modulate interfacial spin of coupling, and even we can think about neuromorphic types of device, but I'm not sure whether we can really, you know, make artificial types of uh, neural network. Uh, and we show this uh, spin accumulation imaging tool using photocurrent method, and a lot of people, you know, ask me, you know, how to build this so on, so my students started the company. <laughs> so if you want to buy this tool, you can visit this website. And I show you an example of wire semi-metal and the ferrimagnetic spintronics. And those two guys are like a bulk-like effect uh, to improve the efficiency. And the, some people ask me, you know, how are you going to think about some commercial aspect of ferrimagnet? Because it's uh, terbium, gadolinium, very reactive materials. But now if you look back 20 years ago, this is a MO disk, magnetic optical disk. Uh, do you know the material of MO disk? This is a cobalt, iron, gadolinium. Okay, so exactly same material. People commercialize already. Uh, so what I'm talking is, you know, we need to translate those knowledge into now, you know, solid state form. All right. For this, I want to acknowledge a lot of my uh, students and collaborators. Thank you very much. For the well seven metals, so you said they were CBD grown uh, by a collaborator. Can you say something about quality? Because usually the CBD is not as good as exfoliated. Well, our switching measurement, in fact, we used the exfoliated uh, okay. uh, sample. But only the spin lifetime measurement, we used the CBD. <coughs> How did you realize the, the, the dependence on the delay between the two processes? How do we realize? Well, how, how exactly did it work? You had a signal which depended on the delay between That's the right. Uh -huh. What was the mechanism that introduced the time dependence into your At This particular measurement, actually, there is uh, some conversion uh, from time delay to uh, some. Um, uh, we use uh, intermediate uh, step. 
to introduce a similar uh, analogy, actually. So it's yeah. not direct, it's not direct uh, to yeah, persons. Yeah. So the question now concerns this, uh, let's say, critical determination of the logical insulators from all angles. Mm. So what is now your take on the real small if you manage to subtract out all the shunning? Mm. Uh, for this, we need to go to very thin region. So typically, we extract this effective spin or angle in uh, 5 to 8 nanometer region. Okay. Uh, so then uh, we can see. In our case, we found spin or angle is about 1.5. Uh -huh. So what does it mean that it's larger than one? Um, it's a concept of, uh, you know, like conductivity. Mm -hmm. So, for example, your transverse conductivity divided by longitudinal conductivity concept. So your transverse conductivity can be larger in certain cases. It's not by the definition of the total uh, spin current. Yeah. So some people, you know, also ask the same question. If you input, you know, five electrons, how can you have more than... It's not like this. Huh? Oh. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the galvanium cobalt. Do you um, did you do any like reverse of speed measurement? Because it's very magnetic. You can you also expect like a faster switching dynamics? Yeah. So actually, we we are doing. Uh, in fact, the paper is uh, just under review. So we. We measured, uh, so as my title indicated, actually we measured a very fast response in this uh, very magnet. Uh. <coughs> Last question about your the beginning side of frequency. Sure. So I thought that you were working with four moment architecture. So if I want to do the like CO5. So under those uh, constraints, it's actually in the street. Is a good question. If you look at the recent, uh, you know, trend of the clock speed, uh, it's more or less saturated. So Intel, you know, they don't increase anymore actually. Uh, so that's why we need uh, alternative, uh, you know, uh, technology. We need to look at different direction. Whether we increase functionality, and you know, not fun you know, the clock, and whether we just want to put more transistors. But that also related to the total power consumption. So they don't want to put any more you know, transistors, actually. So that's why, as Thomas showed, now they are doing you know, all these GPU, TPU types of, you know, divide into small units and let them calculate some individual calculation. And later, you want to sum up those. So, uh, so those are some you know, like neural network types of calculation and so on. That is, the, I think, the, one of the major trends. For example, the other major you know, effort is a quantum uh, computation. Uh, but it's totally different to region. So I think those are uh, basically escaping from the conventional you know, von Neumann architecture. Thank you. <coughs> Very last one. I think in general, compare or comment on the difference between ferromagnetics and anti-ferromagnetics in terms of the three dynamics or the uh, moments of the time stuff. Mm. That's a very really, really common on what's the difference, what's the advantage of its ferromagnetics compared to anti -ferromagnetics. Well, actually, if you look at textbook, huh, uh, anti-ferromagnet is a special case of ferromagnet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I'm talking, you know, for example, this uh, physics, uh, once you inject spin, if you have a uh, perfect antiferromagnet, huh? spin diffusion length should be infinite. Huh? Because you can compensate you know, spin relaxation huh? in, uh, in opposite uh, exchange field, basically. Uh, so maybe this is what uh, you know, uh, Matthias is measuring, maybe. In a really good antiferromagnet, you know, spin will never decay. But of course, in real material, you have defect, impurity, all kind of you know, dirty stuff. So we will have a finite you know, length scale. But even in a metallic you know, sample, look at this. We can measure up to 13 nanometer of you know, cobalt terbium. You know, spin can survive. In a metallic sample, you have a lot of conduction electrons here. <laughs> this is really surprising to me. But in a ferromagnetic material, what we measure is only 1.2 nanometer. You immediately you know, kill all the spin you know, information. <clears throat> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you.